Mitte. Um, good evening, everybody. Uh, we welcome you all for the today's uh, lockdown lecture series by Dr. Manavi. So, Dr. Manavi um, is the chief of um, retina services at Aravind Eye Hospital, Pondicherry. She, she did her uh, fellowship at uh, Shankar Netralya Eye Hospital. So, we welcome you, madam. Over to you for your talk on diabetic retinopathy. everybody i i always have to say, what what is at four o'clock is it good afternoon or evening three o'clock is definitely afternoon. i'm pretty sure the evening so what about four and if, if you're sleeping at home but if you're up good evening so i say just a cup of coffee and then i'm sharing my now So I'm sharing my screen. Ah, slides are visible, madam, but audio is breaking, madam. Okay. Ah, now, now better. Now is it better? Yeah, much, much better, okay. madam. We can start. Okay. Uh, so, yeah. uh, just uh, pop in in between if the audio or the video goes off. So what we are going to talk about is I'm, I'm going to address a few issues about uh, management of diabetic retinopathy. So let's start off with this one picture which keeps making the rounds of social media very often and I'm sure all of us have seen. So it was in 1922 that Banting and Count, uh, his colleagues discovered the use of in treatment of diabetes. And before this, it was a fatal disease, especially in children with type 1 diabetes. And in this, uh, they went around with these children hospital in Toronto uh, and uh, injected all the comatose children with purified uh, ox extract of uh, insulin. And uh, the children started waking up from coma. And that was a landmark treatment of treatment about, and it's nearly 100 years for that. From that time to now, the disease, its treatment, its pathologies have all come a very long way. So what we are going to look at is how do you take decisions when you are looking at a patient with diabetic retinopathy. It's not just one thing that you have to look at and, and you can see with treatment. There are many multiple factors which pathologies have all come a very long way. So what we, I will break this up into different clinical pearls on the geography, optical coherence tomography, on the management of diabetic macular edema, on the management of proliferative diabetic retinopathy, on surgery for diabetic retinopathy i'll touch upon how important the systemic status is and how there can be more than diabetic retinopathy in a patient diabetes. since i think we have a wide range of audience over here including uh, postgraduates as well as some other consultants the topic will cover various levels of knowledge of since i think we have a wide range of so fundus in acid is one of the most commonest uh, investigations that we do in diabetic retinopathy. And these are the main indications for SSA. To determine the macular status, that is to determine the status of perfusion of the macula. 
to stage diabetic retinopathy accurately to detect neovascularization because sometimes obviously the neovascularization, the NVD and the NVE is very obvious. One, how important the systemic safety obviously more and have to be able to detect them clearly to determine cause of loss of vision, to determine cause of non-resolving macular edema. I think we have a wide range of audience who will think the proposed match the NVE is very obvious associated conditions. Let's see some examples. So if you look at this image here, this is what is written in terms of what's called as a macular ischemia. As you can see, there is capillary drop. There is no capillary. The entire dark area is which is the ischemic part of the macula. If you look at this image, macula, and the macula is said to be ischemic when the ischemic area is close to the micron. So the disc is 1500 microns. So it's pretty obvious. This is much, much, much when the ischemic area is close to the micron. Madam, uh, this is another patient. You can see this. Uh, yeah. Can you hear yeah, me? Oh, the slides are coming a bit slower, madam. I think uh, after you press the slide, it takes another uh, 10 seconds for it to come. So we can wait for some time and then we can start. Okay. Uh, yeah, now we can see right. the, uh, right. the macular ischemia here. So this large area where there are no, uh, no capillary seen, which is completely dark. This is ischemic and it's a very large area. So this is right on right. Because the macular ischemia is such a proliferation front on the disc, a big, huge neovascularization at the disc. But if you look at the remaining peripheral fundus, there's absolutely no perfusion. This is where the macula is, and there's a very small area of capillaries. So this extensive non perfusion in the periphery, obviously indicating extensive ischemia in this eye. Now, if we look at asteroid hyalosis, as we know, these are these calcium crystals which are there in the a vitreous of a person and they obstruct our view of the fundus. And as you can see, in this obviously extensive ischemia, uh, calcium crystals which are there in presence of diabetic retinopathy or the exact staging of diabetic retinopathy in these eyes. But when you do a fundus fluorescence in angiography, the small wavelength blue light easily traverses these uh, particles of asteroid in the vitreous and you get a fundus image, which is just like an FFA image in a normal person. So you can see this fundus image here shows a lot of leakage around the macula, but you can also see this lots of small, small neovascularizations everywhere. If you look at another peripheral image, you can see that there are far more bits of neovascularization everywhere. So in a patient with asteroid, it is very easy to detect neovascularization with the breath when you do a fundus fluorescein angiography and will help you not to miss this important condition. Another condition is something that is called as a featureless retina. It means that when you look at a retina clinically, it appears like something like a mild to a moderate diabetic retinopathy. You do not obviously see any signs of neovascularization. This can occur sometimes in patients with renal involvement also. Uh, and what in, in such eyes, when you do an angiography, you can see, like if you see in this eye again, the posterior pole image of FFA in this eye also looks like a moderate NPDR. But when you look at the periphery, you can see a lot of these neovascular fronts happening over there. And thus, you can easily detect the neovascularization in such eyes. it can help you diagnose some unusual conditions also. So this was one patient of diabetes who came with extensive hard exudates in the posterior pole and with a large macular edema which was not responding to a couple of injections of avastin. But when we did, an, uh, this is a fundus fluorescein angiography here and this is an ICG angiography here. The disc is dark postgraduate. So when images, here you can see a lot of choroidal vessels very easily seen and the disc is black. That means this is an ICG angiography. So you can see there are these multiple small, small hyperfluorescent spots over here in this frontus fluorescein angiography. These are numerous multiple retinal arterial macro aneurysms, RAM as they are called in this patient. A very unusual case in both the eyes the patient had this. So you can see these are increasing in leakage in the late phase of the angiogram. There was another patient. This is a patient who is a case of a lasered proliferative diabetic retinopathy and he came with a drop in vision and when we did his OCT we could see this huge neurosensory detachment of the retina and we suspected CSR. Now, now we, 
you may have a question as to why am I not thinking of this as diabetic macular edema. So look at the retinal layers here. They are of normal. They are normal. There is there are there's no edema in this, but there's a large fluid over it. So this very obviously looks like a only that you would see in the patient of CSR. And when we did an angiogram in this patient, if you see, these are the laser marks in the periphery, and you can see a lot of microaneurysms and changes of diabetic retinopathy. But if you look at this one particular spot here, which is hyperfluorescent, and as you can see in the later phases, it increases. So this is an ink blot leak because of CSR, which was lasered with successful resolution of the fluid in this patient. The other investigation, the most important investigation in today's era is OCT or optical coherence tomography. It, it, is, it is probably the most vital tool in our clinics today because not only does it help us diagnose a lot of conditions, it helps us quantify the conditions, it helps us qualify conditions and it helps us to see the response to treatment. And as I think all of us are will be all of the postgraduates also will be aware is that most of our treatment decisions today are based on vision and on the changes that we see on OCT and repeat treatment. A lot of criteria are defined by OCT. Let us look at some of the main important characteristics on OCT that we see in a patient with diabetic macular edema. So this is what is called a spongy edema or intraretinal fluid. When you can see the whole retina is folded up like a sponge. And if you pay attention, there are these some hyper uh, reflective dots over here because this is this is defined in terms of reflectance now. So these are what are called as hyper reflective foci, HRF, or hyper reflective spots, something which is getting a lot of attention nowadays in, uh, in, uh, in AMD, RVO, as well as DME and its management, though nobody is very sure where they lead. These are small dots of equal reflectance to the RPE layer without back shadowing. The ones with back shadowing are supposed to be hard exudates and they are not visible on the infrared or fundus photography or clinically. Coming to another image. This is another patient with diabetic macular edema who has the large serous macular detachment or subretinal fluid and also a lot of cystoid changes in the macula. You can see these cystoid changes happening here, along with numerous hyperreflective foci. This this layer that you see here is a thin draping of his vitreous over the edematous retina. So here you can see this this particular scan has got a small uh, pocket of uh, SRF. It has a few cystoid changes. It has spongy edema here. It has hyperreflective foci also over here. And you can see some of them have back shadowing. So these are probably going to be hard exudates. As you can see in this image, these hard exudates would be imaged if you took a line through that scan through that line. Another important thing that is, is vitreomacular traction syndrome. So if you look, especially if you look at this is the right eye, this is the same patient's right and left eye. The right eye, if, if somebody was to look at this uh, on fast, or, or, or how you would look at it clinically, it would appear either like a cystoid macular edema or like, like a macular hole, which is because of elevation over here. Uh, so this is something important and you can see this, the elevation is much lesser in the other eye, in the left eye. Now, actually, interestingly, what happened is even in the right eye, the patient's vision was six by nine, because if you look carefully, the outer retina is intact. The ellipsoid zone, the external limiting membrane, all uh, outer nuclear layer, everything is intact over here. And so the patient was maintaining vision. And hence, nothing was intervened in this particular case, and the patient was advised serial OCTs and observations. On the other hand, if you look at this, even when you see at this infrared photograph here, you can see that there is uh, obviously a large proliferated. And you can see a completely elevated and distorted retina with the fluid here. So this is obviously a fractional retinal detachment happening over here. And then there are these other terms which are also gaining a lot of importance now, especially drill, as we call it, or DRIL, uh, destroyed retinal inner layer. So if you look at the inner layer, there's no separation in these layers. They're, they're all, all poleased to form one kind of an amorphous layer. So this indicates ischemia and a lot of cell death and a neuronal death and and the architecture is lost. And if you look at the outer layers also here, you can see the ellipsoid zone 
or what used to be called as the ISOS line, the uh, it also lost as well as the external limiting membrane. You, the external limiting membrane is visible at the ends over here and here, but in the center of what is actually the fovea, it is lost. So all of these factors. So even here, the central macular thickness is not more, and there's a kind of a pole contour, and there's no cystoid spaces. But definitely, this patient will have pretty poor vision putting all of these factors together. Another example of drill, you can see the layers on this side. So here there is some amount of anatomy and differentiation maintained. Here there are a lot of hard exudates as are seen in this multicolor image over here. A lot of cystoid changes, but there is loss of EZ and uh, ELM here. A lot of hard exudates again here and these retinal layers are completely diffused. So this is an example of drill happening here. So coming to the management of diabetic macular edema. Again, I'm only going to cover on some of the highlights of this. Obviously, this itself could be a huge long talk. But as we all know, the gold standard for treatment is intravitreal injections, which everybody knows are two forms of drugs, two major groups of drugs, the anti-vascular endothelial growth factor or the anti-VEGF agent and the steroid. The anti vegfs currently in use and available in market are ranibizumab, bevacizumab, and aflibercept. And the steroids are triamcelonone acetate, our good old IVTA, and the dexamethasone implant or ozodex. So now what about lasers? I mean, lasers used to be the mainstay or the gold standard once upon a time. What about lasers? So lasers do have a role even today in non-center involving diabetic macular edema and as an adjunct to injection when there are multiple microaneurysms seen clinically. So let us look at a few case examples and different factors which influence decision making in these cases. So before that, that a brief uh, differentiation, I'm sorry. So anti vegfs are usually the chosen first line of treatment and they block vascular endothelial growth factor only. And they do not have a risk of IOP rise or cataract unlike steroids. There are major risk factors there. Uh, the other use of anti vegfs is to reduce preoperatively, uh, uh, this is in, in uh, surgeries when we need to do for uh, traxial retinal detachments where we have these vascular membranes that we need to use anti-VEGF injection to reduce the vascularity. But we need to uh, also, if there is a cardiovascular risk, so the, which, is, which has been shown to be quite significant and higher where drugs like bevacizumab have been used in much larger doses as infusion for metastatic carcinomas is much lesser in case of ocular use, but it does exist. Now, steroids, usually we use them in patients who are non-responders to anti -vegers. So what do you mean by a non-responder? So after three consecutive monthly injections, if there is a less than 10% response or a less than 10% reduction in the central macular thickness, it is usually labeled as a non-responder. We can use it, we do use it as a first line of treatment in patients with chronic uh, edema, or where there are extensive hard exudates. Of course, the risk of IOP rise and cataract has to be explained. And as we know, IVTA is very cheap, very economical, and very easily affordable to the large population of our country, but has more of a risk of IOP rise and cataract. Ozodex, though expensive, is very safe and a very effective modality of treatment. So, what do you do if you have seen a patient with diabetic macular edema who has a history of a myocardial infarct or a stroke? As you know, these are all confounding factors, right? Diabetes is a factor which can lead to MI or stroke. So what do you do if you are seeing a patient with this and has, he has macular edema? You avoid antivirus. If it's more than six months, it's usually safe. A cardiovascular event many years or a long time in the past is something that we really did not bother about if there's no active pathology happening now. And about so so when do you switch treatment? So like I said, when you have anti vegf non-responders, probably at least three injections of anti vegf you would wait for usually when many years pathology and you have anti five. And there have been studies uh, which have shown that anti vegfs are better in treatment of DME. But the same subgroup analysis in these studies has shown that uh, the, the efficacy of anti and steroid growth is equivalent in pseudo eyes. So probably it was progression of cataract which reduced the efficacy in fakey eyes. So the question out there is, would anybody choose to use steroids as a first line of treatment in pseudo eyes? 
So coming to these case examples, well, so this is a patient who had diabetic macrophagia and he was forced to multiple injections of paracetamol. And he was a poor responder, and hence he received Ozodex implant. Ozodex implant, this gentleman suffered an AMI, and hence he could not follow up. But he reviewed back after three months when he was systemically comfortable and stable and had pursued a drop in vision just a week before. After all, he was comfortable for nearly three months. And after that, he went ahead and he had a recurrence of edema and he went ahead to receive a repeat positive. Now, of course, at this point, the AMI was also a factor which helped us lean towards a steroid usage for treatment of this patient. So, also have been shown by studies also, but the, the, the place where this really makes a difference is that it has the same half-life in a vitrectomized eye as a non-vitrectomized. So what happens is in, in a normal eye, the gel vitreous holds the anti-VEGF drug or the steroid drug and it kind of acts like a depot and in the drug disperses slowly. Now, once you have vitrectomized the eye, all that you have there is liquid. It, it's just water in there. And so the drugs literally vanish out of the eye. Even when we give something like IV, you know, it's, it's literally gone within three, four, five days from the eye. Whereas Ozodex stays for the same amount of time, so about two to three months that we see otherwise. And hence, it's a good option in vitrectomized eye. But what happens is when you inject it, that pellet or that, that implant can actually, because there's no resistance, go very forcefully. And it can hit the retina can cause blading. So again, this has to be injected it very, very carefully in a vitrectomized eye. And another complication which has been widely reported is the migration of the implant into the anterior chamber in a fakey eyes or eyes with no PC. So this was one of our patients. She had an SFI. And following which she was having chronic CME. And so she received an Ozotex implant, which on POD1 was seen to be migrated into the AC. So... Uh, my, one of my brilliant colleagues actually very carefully went into the AC with the side port and manipulated and pushed the implant back into the posterior chamber. And luckily, it didn't migrate again and, uh, and she didn't lose the implant. Otherwise, if it migrates again, we need to remove that implant off from the AC because it can cause uh, corneal decompensation. So this is another interesting patient. So this is the right eye of one particular gentleman who you can see has got a lot of subretinal fluid, a lot of spongy edema, a lot of cystoid spaces, and quite a lot of hyper-reflective foci, HRF over here. So now he received two injections of Avastin, and the response was not much. He had a very poor response to the Avastin. There's practically no response to Avastin. And after this, <coughs> he received an injection of IVTA, for which the response was pretty good. And there was significant reduction in edema, <coughs> but that came back quite significantly back. And so he needed an injection of Ozodex, and following Ozodex, their edema was showing a good response. Now, the same gentleman in his eye had edema, and very few are, are practically nil HRF, and this particular eye showed a complete resolution of the edema with two injections of Avastin. So where this is leading us is that one of the hypotheses behind this is that HRS could be indicative of a more stronger inflammatory pathology behind the origin of DM. And that is why the patients with numerous HRS may do better with steroids or may need an earlier switch over from an anti to steroids. This is the uh, this is a message that seems to be coming forth from whatever studies or whatever publications are out on HRF. And there's another patient who has multiple HRF and he also has a hard exudate plaque in the center of the fovea. And because of the hard exudate plaque, he received an injection of IVPA, which showed a prompt resolution of edema. But of course, the vision was poor after this also because of the subfovial hard exudate plaque. And patient with chronic diabetic macular edema, like you can see these large cystoid spaces, very skytic, the retina is, lot of loss of inner, outer layers, uh, very distorted anatomy. Usually in such cases, the first choice is steroids. Uh, and they don't do much in such kind of case. And when you have non-central involving diabetic macular edema, like you can see, uh, there are numerous microaneurysms here leaking out hard exudates everywhere but not involving the center, what we do is laser, like I said. So laser can be focal, wherein you do 
closer to the microaneurysms themselves it can be grid when it is given into the area of thickening alone there's no c there's no avoiding the papillomacular bundle all those are older so wherever you have thickening like in this area you have thickening you will do the grid there and a modified grid which is a combination of both so you do focal to the microaneurysms you see you give grid to the area of thickening so that's what is called as modified grid laser main history of treatment for proliferative diabetic retinopathy so this is pretty obvious this is probably something that even an undergrad knows that if you have pdr you do three settings of pan retinal photocoagulation brilliant that's it great but what after that so that's not the end of the story right so what do you do after that so you need to wait for at least 2 to 3 months for the prp to take effect because as i think we are all aware the uh, the, the principle is to convert an anox uh, hypoxic retina to anoxic and reduce the vegf so for all of that to happen and the vegf to reduce and then for the nvs to regress or reduce it takes some time and if you uh, if there is good regression you just observe keep the patient under observation but if the regression is poor and you still seeing active nves you have to judge as to how much of the there are how many active nves and how good or uh, is the laser coverage or how much of gap areas are there and accordingly add more laser in maybe in one setting or two setting depending on that what if the patient has vitreous hemorrhage the first thing you do is do a b scan ultrasound to rule out a tracheal retinal detachment and if there is any area of retina visible you do laser there and you can wait if there is no trd if there is no detachment especially no detachment in the posterior pole involving or threatening the fovea on b scan you can observe it wait for a month or two and keep doing more laser as the hemorrhage keeps clearing if a patient has bilateral hemorrhage or a tracheal retinal detachment then he needs to be taken up to surgery you always remember when you are reviewing a patient of prp to check their systemic status if the blood sugar control is poor the neovascularizations are not going to resolve well and how do you long do you wait for the vitreous hemorrhage to clear for maybe a month or two not longer than that the older diabetic vitrectomy study said 6 months and what not what but that was done in a long time ago where vitrectomy was was an entirely different ball game and today with our machines and our technology we we are in a position to give much better results to our patients just a very brief mention of protocol s where they studied prp versus ranibizumab and found ranibizumab to be slightly better in the first paper that they came out with but needed 10 to 14 injections throughout two years so how does this translate to day to day practice in our current scenario is probably one of the biggest questions out there coming to an important important aspect over here that is surgery for diabetic retinopathy so the main indication of vitreous diabetic involving or threatening tracheal retinal detachment followed by recurrent or non resolving vitreous hemorrhage and a combined or egmatous retinal detachment and other indications which are less common let's look at some case scenarios to understand how things vary in different patients and how decisions can be made so when you look at a tracheal retinal detachment an eye which is something like this or like this where there's a large covering the entire posterior pole and the retina is all elevated it, it's a no brainer you have to operate this eye you go ahead and do a surgery these these are these are all pod 1 picks and that's why you may see a lot of hemorrhages and all madam a post graduate i am not sure if no one am i no one we are seeing the trd madam uh, like the, the slide has come with a bit of a delay on okay, okay. what i do i play all my images and then i start talking ah, yes, so sir. here here these two eyes where you can see a very obvious prd with a lot of large prolifs over the posterior pole and you can see they, this the, these kind of cases obviously you need to need surgery there's nothing else that can be done in these cases you need to go ahead and operate these cases and this these are pod 1 pictures again because this is pod 1 you can see a lot of hemorrhages and all over here which clear away over time another scenario is where you have this prh or a pre retinal hemorrhage as it is very often called overlying the posterior pole uh, again if you look at this particular example of a patient you know he he actually 
he has more than three fourths of his cornea open, and so he's got pretty good vision. He's he's seeing something like six twelve in the side, and is complaining of pain, of scotoma kind of thing. Now, what happens is that you know, you know, typically if you go back to what we spoke about several days ago, you look at an eye with vitreous, you see if you have area available, do laser in whatever area is available, wait for it to resolve. Keep adding laser. Now, if you look at that, if you look at this particular eye in that light, the entire 360 degree peripheral retina where you want to do your PRP is visible to you and available, so you can easily do all of that laser off. But what is actually happening here is that there is this dot blob of hemorrhage which is underneath and attached and a very, a very stiff posterior hyaloid. So basically, basically a Lot of or almost all retinal pathologies are based upon the vitreoretinal interface. So unlike we were taught way back in our undergrad that vitreous is an inert substance in the posterior chamber of the eye, it's actually nothing like that. Our livelihood based is based on that vitreous, and it is what causes all these pathologies in this eye. And we we deal with that vitreous to take away all these pathologies in this eye. So so you have a very taut and an adherent vitreous here. With this loculated blood, which is not going to get absorbed or go anywhere, and if you look in this particular eye, you see this whitish spot. This is a neovascular front or a locus over there. So what happens is when you laser the periphery, this neovascularization starts regressing, and this blood and the taut hyaloid gives impetus or gives gives like a scaffold for the fibrous membranes to proliferate. So this blood, you see the patient after two months, now this blood clot will be almost looking the same. And then, and then somebody might think, oh, it's still there, and may add more laser, add more laser, and as you keep doing that, the periphery keeps getting lasered, and the posterior pole keeps on having more and more, more and more fibrous component developing, with the underlying retina developing more and more traction. Such cases, if taken up for a surgery at this late point, have a very complicated surgery and a very poor outcome. But if these patients are taken up for surgery early, at an early point like this, when they present, sometimes with maybe a little bit of peripheral laser, or you can even do the laser intraoperatively, it's actually a very simple surgery. You can very easily lift and separate off the entire hyaloid, trim off this front. Most of the time, they don't even require an oil tamponade, and they recover vision much better than if you delay the surgery. So this is again a post-operative day one picture. And the reason it's easy because there's some dispersed blood in the eye. Which was gone off by one month, and the patient was doing well after that. This is an example of another patient. So these are again examples where you don't have an obvious fractional retinal detachment. So if you look at this, this patient's got an NVD which is still active, and there's this large fibrous tissue overlying the posterior pole, and. Because of that, if you look at the OCD, even here you can see there's a very beautiful cleavage plane between the retina and the tissue, and there's a huge tissue lying here. Now, obviously, this is going to obstruct vision of the patient. So, if you do a surgery and remove this off, you do well. If you keep lasering it for a long time, this is going to keep contracting as this NVD regresses, and it's going to keep causing traction on this retina, retina and is, the condition is going to keep worsening. This is another very interesting patient. This is a lady with proliferative diabetic retinopathy, and uh, this is a montage of her eye. And she has got this uh, prolif, which is mainly nasal. The macula and all is fairly intact, with a little bit of hemorrhage here and there. She has had laser. You can see laser spots in the periphery. Now, what is interesting is when you look very carefully at this eye, there is a break over here. So normally, when you have traction on the retina, it leads to a tractional retinal detachment. And when that traction worsens at areas of thinning or more traction, it can lead to a break or a hole, which adds a retinogenous component to a tractional detachment, which makes it a combined retinal detachment. Now, this lady doesn't have much of a detachment anywhere, but she has the break here and a large prolif. And if you look at her other eye. It's again very similar, again with a break over here. So this was another very interesting case scenario, wherein the options, both the options are equally right. One option is you can go in and plan for an early surgery before the membranes become very, very fibrous and adherent, and you can clear them out. Now you have to also remember because her retina and posterior pole is attached, she had bilaterally six twelve vision, and she was like thirty eight years old. So 
So there's there's a lot involved over here. On the other, you can observe this to see whether it remains stable or it attaches, or you can do an early surgery. So do you want to do that? That's that's the question over here. Now there are some other eyes. So if if you look at an eye like this, this is another elderly lady. If you get this eye, the disc is pale. All the vessels are closed, and there's a lot of fibrous membranes, and and the disc is pale. And when you do an OCT, it's very skyping. That means don't get anything anywhere. This patient had had something like a one by sixty vision, and she could ambulate. Both her eyes were like this, unfortunately, but she could ambulate in. In familiar areas, to a certain extent, in such a best option not to operate because there isn't much you can do. The retina is very degenerated, and very often surgery in these eyes can lead to loss of that little bit of that one by sixty. So you're not going to gain, but she, if she loses that and she becomes PL or NPL, then she's going to lose that ambulation in familiar areas also. And you really can't expect much more than that in such a bad retina. So best option is to not touch these eyes. The other thing that we need to do is you, you need to be very aware of where you need to watch eyes very carefully. So this is these are the two eyes of a same gentleman, and if you see the right eye, he's got all his blood vessels are sclerosed, a very unhealthy looking, yeah, very burnt out retinopathy actually, and he's got a chronic traction which has led to a macular hole. Vision is very poor in this eye. The retina is very unhealthy. It, there's not much to be gained by operating. The other eye has got this flimsy membrane, a little bit of sclerosed vessels. The 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 PDR is inactive here. There's no no active neovascularization. Whatever laser there is in the periphery has regressed it. But there's this fibrous tissue. There's a bit of a fold of retina happening over here. This is his only seeing eye, and it has got good vision, six, twelve, and all. So you don't really need to operate this eye. But as the vitreous in these eyes over time keep changing it can cause is it can cause contraction of these fibrous membrane it can cause elevation of the retina and worsening of these eyes so despite it being a, a nil visual prognosis to do not operate eye and a stable eye we need to keep watching this patient closely with regular follow ups to monitor if the traction is worsening in this side patient so again like we say we operate macula involving or macula threatening tractal retinal detachment here if you see of course this particular patient does have some activity of his nvds here but the rest of it is regressing he's had a this this which is after an adhesion tag again a fold developing here this extra macula near the arcade large prolif these things you know you know because you have an active nvd here active nvd here you don't have traction on the macula macula is on vision is good so you're not going to operate you have active neovascularization so you're going to laser progressing the neovascularization now as the nv starts regressing this fibrous tissue is going to start contracting and there's a very high probability that you know all of this around these fibrous tissues around all of this attachment is thing is just going to start lifting up And when in surgery, and hence these are another category of patients where though everything is fine, I think around the next five years, we see that another thing what he can do rapidly means in a month or two or three. Now coming to some other decision-making scenarios, like like when you see a bilateral disease, uh, which eye do you operate first? So one scenario, this is a very fairly clear-cut scenario. Uh, these are representative images, okay? Just to make my point known. So this is a stable lasered eye, no no prolif, no neovascularization. This is okay. The other eye has a TRD. Obviously, you go ahead and operate. No break. Now, if you come to this eye, there's a there's an eye which is very bad. The the, the 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 one eye of this patient has got extensive TRD and extensive membranes. The other eye has got a small proliferation and vitreous hemorrhage. So, which do you operate? You operate the better eye in this scenario because. the surgery will be simpler the underlying retina is likely to be more healthier and hence the patient is likely to get better vision in this eye and then you go and operate the other eye 
so that that can keep recovering vision slowly and the patient is has a better chance of a little earlier recovery of some ambulatory or useful vision now the other way down now if you look at these two eyes one eye is a bad trd the other eye has got a large fibrous polyp on the posterior pole so there is not fractional retinal detachment as yet there are folds in the retina and all but this what is called as vitreo papillary traction that is now this vitreous is pulling on the disc or the ohs which can also lead to a loss of vision but the vision in the left eye is good right now it's about 6 to 12 in vitreo papillary traction so that will need surgery but that can wait and here in you can go in for operating the worst type first so so what what i mean to say by this again let's look at another scenario again what we saw earlier the patient with the pre macular pre hemorrhage obscuring part of the whole of macula in one eye and an extensive tear in the other eye you operate the eye with the prh for two reasons one is it will retain vision faster it will regain better vision and also to prevent that eye from becoming as bad and get getting a very bad prd as you keep waiting macular prelim in one eye and another the final scenario to put forth is when both the eyes have large ffp then the both the eyes have bad trd which try to do first here in you can take in various factors like the vision in either eye and state of the retina how healthy or unhealthy the retina is which i have had longer loss of vision which i have had less than take a call there is no clear cut guideline there is nothing that can say in this scenario you try to do the you do you always but also to the better eye first or you always do the worst eye first sometimes you know even when you have two bad eyes you may want to touch the better eye because the bad eye sometimes you may like to when the retina is a very actually if you want to give a chance you may want to touch the worst eye so that at least the better of the two eyes can maintain some amount of vision so these these this is a very, a very uh, case to case based and very surgeon to surgeon way so sometimes you know when you have two bad eyes you may want to touch it it also depends to a large extent on what a particular surgeon is compared is very worst eye but sometimes you may like to when the retina actually if you want to maintain some amount of vision so yes and very surgeon to surgeon way surgeon it also the next day they may find me saying another thing and yeah so if you know the post graduates of our hospital who here comes up next day they may find me saying another thing and So, so coming, moving on, just the eye that we are treating. Okay, we are treating a patient, not an eye, and definitely not just a retina. So that we should not forget. A point in status here is, you know, we have the usual conundrum of cataract or diabetic retinopathy keeps on happening, and uh, we should remember that, you know, sometimes though though dictum says wait for the diabetic macular edema should be treated first, and the cataract. sometimes when the patient has a lot of cataract you are in a good scenario to do a cataract with an injection combined so that at least the cataract part of the vision improves rapidly you know so one should always keep that also in mind that we need to give ultimately we are trying to do the vision so this is one patient here who came to us with this massive diabetic macular edema you guys so one should here who came to us with this massive edema as you can see huge so a lot of our exercise happening and the same patient this is his other ocd 3 months later where in the macular edema has Adam. reduced dramatically yes we are not yes, we are not seeing madam that uh, it's yeah i'll wait ah uh, yes madam it had been taking time to come so the top image is is a uh, is the patient at presentation with a massive macular edema and the lower image is the same patient 3 months later so what did this diabetic macular edema respond to there's quite a lot of difference in the macular what did it respond to so obviously when this patient was first seen and the ocd was done the person the consultant seeing it very rightly and promptly advised the patient to have an intravitreal injection but that injection was not received by the patient because at that point his blood sugar was more than 500 mg per cent the patient was told by the counselor to get his sugars control and sent the injection was in blood sugar was without having received any ocular treatment but now his sugars were down to 250 and just with that control of sugar there was so much of a difference in his macular edema so it is very very important for us 
pay attention to the systemic status of the patient when we are looking at his or her macular edema or proliferative disease. We can't just treat the eye alone. This is another very interesting patient who had a renal involvement, extensive renal involvement, and presented to us with very poor vision in both the eyes. The distal temporal pallor has extensively sclerosed vessels in both the eyes. One you can minute. see some hemorrhage and some proliferative fronds. Or yeah, it will come. Can All it right. come? Okay. So pale disc, temporal pallor, extensively sclerosed vessels, and very thinned out phobias on OCT. Right? And when we did an angiogram for this patient, there was an absolutely complete loss of perfusion in the posterior pole. Absolutely completely dark black posterior poles with just a little bit of vessels present around. So there, there can be some very dramatic situations also that we can see in such patients. So, so what is the systemic status important for us? Of course, we need good systemic control for a good outcome of visual and our treatment, whether it's PRP or it's injection or it's surgery. We also need to remember that renal patients can have an increased fluid load. This can reflect in two ways. The increased fluid load can lead to an increase in the macular edema. Also, these in patients with increased fluid load can develop CCF during surgery. They also find it very difficult to lie down for surgery. And hence, we need to schedule that surgery in conjunction with their dialysis schedule. So they need to have dialysis in the morning and we operate in the afternoon or dialysis the earlier day evening and we operate them next day morning so that the fluid load is minimal in the body. So the patient is comfortable and the anesthetist is comfortable and thereby the surgeon is comfortable in doing the surgery. Another important thing that we need to see is that if even if you're looking into the eye, it's not just diabetic retinopathy which can occur. There is more than that which can occur in a patient. We need to look beyond diabetic retinopathy. So I think this is a pretty classical case. Disc edema in both the eyes. You can see it even on the OCT, the disc edema is there. There's a little bit of, of course, fibrous tissue extensive in the left eye. So this patient obviously has anterior ischemic optic neuropathy or AION, which is also very common in patients with diabetic retinopathy. And finally, I am coming to this. This is one. Uh, this, this this video is just a representative video. Uh, is the video seen? Yes, madam. Seen, madam. So, so this is uh, the video is basically about. This is how my cubicle is, and this it's not about this particular patient, but just to show how our cubicles are. He's a gentleman with bilateral vitreous hemorrhage, being escorted by his wife into my room to sit on the examination chair to come for surgery admission. So you can see the chair is kind, the cubicle is kind of narrow. There's an attendant chair there. There's this examination chair that the patient needs to sit on, and then it, it's a, it's quite a bit of a manipulation for a patient with poor vision to come in and sit down. Now, it's not about this patient. So what happened is one day, this gentleman of around 40 years of age uh, comes into my room with a complaint of defective vision for the past two weeks. And when he enters my room, he stumbles. He, 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 he kind of goes and bangs into that attender's chair and then he has difficulty finding out where the uh, examination chair is and he asks his sister for help to sit onto it. When I open his case sheet and look at it, I see that his vision is recorded as 6 9. So I'm like, okay, our, our optometrists are very generous. They want our patients to see. So that's why probably the vision is 6 9. She's done a good refraction. And uh, when I ask him, and he says defective vision, what I am expecting when I look into his eye is I'm going to see proliferative diabetic retinopathy uh, with, the, with probably the posterior pole and the phobia okay, which is why the vision is 6 9, but with hemorrhage and prolifs in the periphery, which is what is obscuring his vision. When I looked into his eye, he, he's just got hardly a mild to moderate NPDR. There's, there's nothing significant happening in the fundus. So now I go and ask him more, actually, what is happening to you? So he says he's been bumping into things when walking. And that's why then and there I do a confrontation test. And thereby we discover that he has a, he has a home animal. Yeah. And then he was sent to a neuro-ophthalmologist and we could diagnose that he had 
and postural infarct, which was causing basically cortical issue ear problem. So in my in retina clinic also we can so I, you know this patient could very easily have been sent off like you have moderate NPDR, even a glass prescription, told to control his sugars and review back after four to six months. It was just a, a very high grade of suspicion on, on how, why was this gentleman walking in such a peculiar manner and was so uncomfortable coming into my room that actually led me to check his uh, fields with the confrontation because something which we don't do in a retina clinic normally. We should probably be looking at a lot of these things normally when we evaluate the patient, but it doesn't happen in day-to-day -day practice for obvious practical reasons. So to conclude, it's not it's not just A, B, C, D. There's a lot of things. It's a lot of complicated equations that you need to take into consideration. You need to look at the patient as a whole, taking his eye, the whole eye, from the anterior to the posterior segment. You need to take in his systemic status and multiple factors into consideration before you can lead to a treatment for diabetic retinopathy. Thank you. Thank you, madam, for the wonderful lecture. Uh, we are now open to questions. So if anybody want to ask questions, you can unmute your mic and ask, or you can type in your chat screen. Madam, there are a few questions in the chat screen and um, they're asking what is VEGF trap and can you explain? What happened? So, uh, so if you look at Bevacizumab, it's a full length monoclonal antibody to VEGF A molecule. So it's an antibody which goes and traps the VEGF A molecule. Uh, VEGF, uh, VEGF, uh, that is Bevacizumab, uh, Ranibizum segment of that molecule. VEGF trap I is, a, uh, is a receptor decoy. It acts as a decoy, has a competitive binding to VEGF receptors. It competes with VEGF in the eye to bind VEGF receptors. And thereby, it causes a more wider blocker of VEGF and hence is more stronger in, in, in uh, activity and has a more stronger VEGF compete with VEGF in the more wider power of this. This is basically this pharmacology is very strong. If you remember Guyton and first MBBS which was a long time ago and Guyton and Riley opening up receptors and all this is the same principle. And that is ideally and uh, it is available for quite some time, very expensive. It costs 50,000 rupees for one injection. And uh, as against uh, ranibizumab, which causes about uh, 22, and then it has been for quite some time. And, uh, as against uh, which is uh, which, uh, since it's fractionated and given to people, people charge anywhere between five to ten thousand rupees for injection. So that is probably the main any between that is the main problem with ILEA. It is more efficacious, has a more stronger activity, and can be dosed two monthly. Though they recommend three monthly dosing followed by eight weekly dosing, and is probably more effective. So that is for ILEA. From one plus five T and both uh, role of Laser for free macular fresh PRH. I think what you're trying to ask is gang hyaluronic. Can you use the laser to rupture the, the hyaloid in case of a diabetic is very thick and it's very difficult to rupture it. It, it is almost too much. Very easy. And or in patients with something like a leukemic or any retinopathy where the hyaloid is thin. And there you and there if the patient presents to you early. Within the first 24 to 48 hours and the blood is still liquid, you can cause it to drain out. It's very rare to be able to achieve that in a diabetic eye. It can be tried, no doubt, but it very, very rarely clears out. And most often, you need to do surgery. That was for Sarvana Bhava. Uh, Manisha, very rare to be able to achieve that, is asking lipids are not responding to multiple intravitreal. The lipid exudates are not going to go away. And if they are in the fovea, they are going to cause poor vision. They may aggregate and coag 
slowly and for that area may look smaller but they're not going to go away edema may go away so edema going away and that area of scarring become less some visual improvement can be expected in that that's the best you can have lipid lipid exudate that macula nipun is asking in vitreoderma's die with chronic pme no. intravitreal triamcinolone or rosodex which one should be yes yes hello uh yes. ma'am all the response yes Yes, I'm yeah. actually for the patient if the macular edema is still present, should we continue uh, intravitreal for those patients? Like there are lipid deposits, but still uh, edema is persisting. Depends upon how much is the vision of the patient, uh, like in either of the two, and vision. how what is what is the architecture on OCT? How chronic is the edema? Has the edema responded? Various injections. You have to take all of these factors into consideration before deciding whether to continue or to discontinue treatment. Sometimes you need to continue treatment to, just to prevent it from becoming even more worse. Because if you leave it, sometimes the edema just keeps on becoming more and more and more, and and it just becomes worse. But otherwise, yeah, you need to see at all these factors: vision, response to treatment. If it's not responding at all for multiple treatments, there's nothing you can do, right? You may also try to look at if there are a lot of microaneurysms and do a bit of focal over there. That can also add to the response. Okay. Uh, any end point for that? Like, if the patient has vision like six twenty four in the one eye and six by thirty six in the other eye, the patient is responding but still uh, edema is persisting. Uh, should we like uh, um, there is an end point or like we should we can continue intravitreal for long depending upon the various factors into consideration? Keep injecting. Endpoint is when okay, endpoint like... is when the edema is gone. That's the best endpoint in an ideal scenario, yes. which is yes practically not. The other one is when it's absolutely not responding, so there's no use of doing it. And the one that's placed to stop treatment is when the patient stops coming back for use. Okay. Okay. So moving on to the next question, Madam Nipu. Uh, so, triamcinolone or osmotex. So, if the patient can afford osmotex, then definitely prefer it. But he has versus intravitreal eye, and it is not of the eye. So, normally, I not sure, but in our hospital, we have a protocol to see IVTA or steroid patients at one week for a basic IOP check, and the drug is gone at one week. So, it doesn't stay there. So. Uh, yeah, or if if the patient can afford osmotex, is definitely the preferred choice in a vitreoderma. Yeah, somebody is asking. Normally, in our hospital, we have a protocol to see a very very interesting question. Very interesting question. There are numerous studies that show that fibrates and statins are good, even and it, see, it's it's this was a topic which we have also a lot in amongst our colleagues. So, hard exudate in a diabetic eye. Occur because of a breakdown of the blood. Somebody asked yeah, very interesting question. Very interesting. There have been numerous ones, and uh, see, it's it's amongst that the lipid profile. No, many of these patients actually don't have that deranged of lipid profile. It's it's many a times normal, but it has been shown. So there have been studies. So there was a very very famous study by Dr. Mangat Dogra et al. from PGI Group. This was in a pre-anti-VEGF era. It it is almost a more than ten year old study. Wherein, when they saw patients with hard exudates and DME, they sent them first to their medicine colleagues. They were started on statins and fibrates for two to three months. I think those patients had a deranged lipid profile, and they saw a reduction in macular edema just with that macular edema itself, not just the hard exudates part. So this is a question which is very open. But if there are extensive hard exudates in the macula, you can give statins and fibrates, though they do have their side effects. Uh, one can give it a trial. For reducing those hard exudates, but again, it's a breakdown in blood retinal barrier, a very unhealthy retina at the background, which we need to remember. And whenever there are huge clumps of hard exudates, the retina itself is damaged badly in that area. So visual recovery will be moderate, but yes, you can try. I would try. I do try. Diabetic patient with sclerosed vessels and dense fibrous proliferation over disc and arcades, basically burnt out. How, how do you manage? So, so burnt out 
PDR is like one of the showed you which I can do not operate. But the patient has I would give it a chance of surgery to remove that because maybe the patient will see something when the underlying retina is exposed. If there's no activity, one can actually do CRP. But I normally would prefer to laser it because along with everything, I'm not really sure of how much vegetation there is happening in the eye. And they can also end up eventually with an anterior segment neovascularization and then that could lead to only from proliferation of therapy because it's that big procedure to do also. So that is for that question. PVR, PDR, CSME. Severe PDR with CSME, PRP, antivirus, which was what is facing. We go with both that is for that the antivirus, which was what is facing. We go with both together. So, um, so PRP can worsen the macular edema. So that, I think that's where the question comes from. And this worsening of macular edema is more when you do the temporal. Where the question comes from? Uh, PRP is more when you do the temporal. So, edema. so that, I think that's where PRP so especially in an institute like I mean, we can protocol throughout to, to ensure a proper patient care both simultaneously. So you mentioned even when it's bilateral, you know, bilateral PRP and bilateral injections, the patient will come and receive PRP sitting one in both the eyes and get injected in one eye. Go home, come back a week later, in both the eyes, get injected in the second eye. That is how we do it practically. And especially since you're seeing severe PDR, which I presume means higher also very easy. If you have a patient with uh, one NV, which is just a PDR and needs treatment and a lot of macular edema, you could start off with an anti wager wait for a week or two. If you want to switch individual treatment, otherwise, go with both together. Wait for a week or two, otherwise, you can even do it. That's how we do it. Since you're seeing severe PDR. Especially if the burns are extensive, you need to be more careful there. Two days, three days. Generally, if we have to give, we place it by one week minimum. Uh, in in normal eyes, in normal in normal DNA patients or AMD patients, because basically, if it's a patient with or without increased pressure, that's with or without NVG. We usually give one eye and within two or three days, we give the right. Because in those cases, we don't want to wait. There we even do the PRP on consecutive days or every alternate day. So that within a week, we are done with both the PRP and both the injections. If we are giving steroid, we give it in one eye and wait for three days. If it's happening or not, then we go ahead. Uh, Rachana. A role of AMP chart in diabetic retinopathy. The macular attraction syndrome, how frequent? AMP is chart in diabetic retinopathy. I don't know. I guess. Yes. But AMP is usually more a patient who has a, like a dry AMD or blue stents. Then you want to monitor for the appearance of the AMD. When they have DME and so much of distortion, I'm not really sure how much a patient can do. But technically, since it's a macular pathology, and if you're a postgraduate student, yes, you do answer sniffing in diabetic retinopathy. Vitromacular, how frequent follow-up? Depends on how much the traction is. So if, again, example, I showed you the light eye, which had a lot of traction, is that lot of can cause lambular So maybe and the eye did that after the years, and the outcome of getting traction. If it's like in Most cases, 
a week we are done with both the products why not just don't but with also text when it came newly into the market when people were giving also text and i was able to find out that it's right i guess you could do it especially for patients with very minimal dna and not the anti dna teams the some time to develop its action i have a uh, steroid treatment i was where i have seen patients with i guess uh, like mi and stroke and all of that as the first line of treatment actually also and i have seen those edemas resolving off in a week so i don't think there's any logic in giving an antibiotic and a try and a steroid together no i don't dr dipun is asking in dna in first trimester of pregnancy ah uh, steroid 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 so the question is in dna in first trimester of pregnancy for steroids which is preferred pregnancy no antibiotics anytime maybe not even in lactation steroids or laser so that's what you do you do laser you do steroids absolutely not it's going to be talk it, it can pass into the circulation and go to the fetus and uh, lead to an abortion or whatever or whatever anomaly so absolutely contradictory if you do anything and everything one so the tara is asking how to manage not going in anti vege anti vege anti vege anti vege see that your patient is strictly strictly following you up monthly see that the patient systemic parameters are well controlled hemoglobin look at his uh, renal profile switch over to steroids can you hear me now ah uh, yes madam am i audible yes yes okay so we are talking prediction Hello. Uh, it's actually breaking. Okay. A bit slower. Uh, well, my. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Can you hear me? Okay. From which question do you want to start? Uh, we have come up to the last question, madam. There are. Yeah. how to manage non resolving dna is what i was talking about yes so let me complete that so how to manage non resolving dna is you can see that the injections are strictly monthly see that the patient systemic parameters are controlled good control of all of that then uh, get uh, the patient the macular perfusion like is there a large scheme at response can talk very on there are a lot of Yeah, and then you only have a choice of whether you want to try with rectum or not. So that is that. How you to keep trying solving DME? End points for any of these treatment, whether it's DME or AMD, is very difficult. The best case is a patient maintains systemic control, has good follow up, and keeps taking the injection at regular intervals as required for whatever amount of time. Best hope. For maintaining good vision, depending on the scenario. So, anti-vaccine activity. Interesting. Is it a reaction? Why should there be one? Normally, that doesn't occur. I don't think so. If it's an infection, then you need to treat like any end of the mind. We are. Any kind of reaction I don't think is ever seen with an anti-vaccine injection. Not, not in my expert, my opinion. What you can mitis or an infectious fever or not, and that you need to treat in the manner of any other endoscopic mitis, like giving intensive steroid, intensive antibiotic, 
specific topically maybe go into the eye and give an intravitreal and monitor the patients anything else Ma'am, can you repeat the answer for the burnt out PDR, please? Uh, your voice was broken. Okay, so burnt out PDR. The thing is that uh, if there's dense fibrous prolapse, how else can the posterior fold and abdominal be surgery? That uh, proliferation. So if the underlying retina is okay, you may be able to salvage the patient. If it's like one of those which I showed, where I said no surgery. Disc is failed. Vessels are sclerosed. Actually, I just few membranes here and there. You can just leave it alone also. But we really know how much VEGF is actively being produced or not produced in the eye. And as there is VEGF, we do this anterior segment of vascularization, which is a painful line line. So there's really no harm in actively. Thank you, Madam, for that wonderful lecture on um, diabetic retinopathy. It was um, really comprehensive, dealing with the, all the aspects of diabetic retinopathy. So, if there are no further questions, uh, we'll close this session now. Like I am stroke and all of that. As before, sign up if you can Thank, thank you, Madam. For... Madam, Madam. Okay, if there are no further questions, we'll close the session. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, apologies for that uh, slight audio delay.